Hello, Broadway fans. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and joining me is Lily Cooper, star of the new comedy POTUS on Broadway. Lily, I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen anyone make their entrance on stage wearing uh, breast milk pumps, but you pull it off flawlessly. I think you may be the only person in Broadway history, to, uh, first person ever to do this. Um, yeah. I think I might be. And I, I, the really ironic thing is that I'm also a nursing mom. I'm currently in my baby's nursery right now. Um, so I pitched to the director that I literally pump on stage, but it was a little bit too complicated. No, because I knew I would be the first one to ever do that. I thought that would be setting a pretty cool record. <laughs> yeah, this play is, it's so much fun. And the, you know, every scenario is so wild. Is it hard to sort of keep a straight face while you're doing all this? Did that take a lot of practice? I mean, thank God we had the rehearsal time that we did because yes, it's very challenging. I mean, we have comedy legends, Rachel Dratch, Leah Delaria. I mean, like how do you not break and just laugh because they're the funniest people. The entire cast is so hilarious. We definitely had a few moments in rehearsal maybe one or two during previews. Um, but we really pulled ourselves together because yeah, it's truly hilarious. And everyone is so innovative in it, you know, comes up with new hilarious ideas all the time. So when your scene partner throws something brand new at you, it's so hard not to just react to how brilliant and amazing it is. Um, but yeah, we're having so much fun. Yeah, it really is an incredible group of women up there. Uh, I was wondering where in the process did you join? Were any of those names already there? Was it intimidating to step into that room? Oh, intimidating is the perfect word. I think I was one of the later cast members to join. Um, it all happened really quickly for me. It was quite a whirlwind. We, I found out, gosh, what month is it? It's almost May. I think I found out that I booked the job in March um, or in February. And by that time I knew that Vanessa Williams was attached and I knew Leah Delaria and Julie White were all attached. And so I saw, I remember seeing those names in my audition breakdown and being like, I don't belong. I had major imposter syndrome, you know? Yeah. But I read the script and I was just like, this is one of the funniest scripts I've ever read. I'm dying to be in this, dying to be a part of this group of women. And was so thrilled when I found out that I got cast. And then after that was when I found out that Rachel was attached um, and Susie and Julianne. And it just kept getting better and better. You know, it just kept, I kept pinching myself. Each person that I found out was going to be a part of this. And the fact that Susan Stroman's directing, I mean, it's just kind of a, a dream come true. Mm -hmm. It, it has really moved very quickly to get to Broadway this season. You're someone who you've been in, involved in, you know, the creation of musicals before, and you know how long that process usually takes. Um, how does this compare, you know, between doing like an out-of-town tryout and all that development for a show to having to really hit the ground running with this? Yeah, this has been, I think, the speediest process I've ever been a part of, especially in a new show. Um, yeah, I'm used to, you know, writers working on musicals for seven to 10 to 15 years. Selena, our writer, um, she's really young, she's 28. She's been working on this play for, I think about two or three years, but just the, the you know, propelling it onto Broadway happened so fast. I auditioned in February, I think. I found out I booked it a week later. We started rehearsals in March and we even moved forward our opening date so that would be, we would be a part of this season. Um, and uh, it's my first straight play on Broadway. So I'm used to rehearsing for about two months for a Broadway musical. We only rehearsed for one month. And, you know, being in this crazy world and the, living through this pandemic, several of us contracted COVID during the rehearsal process. And that meant we had to miss, you know, up to 10 days of rehearsal. Um, and when you have such a short amount of time, that was such a challenge, but thank goodness for Zoom because we ended up just being home watching it and our fabulous understudy stepped in in rehearsal. So yeah, it's been a total whirlwind. 
Um, but I'm really, really proud of where we are. We kind of, we had our first audience last week and I, we all kind of looked at each other and we couldn't believe it was happening. Mm. And it well, straight play, but you do get a slight musical moment with none other than Vanessa Williams. So that's, that's pretty fun to watch. <laughs> I just like, I'm, <clears throat> I'm holding a microphone and looking at Vanessa Williams on a Broadway stage. Can you believe? I can't. It's crazy. Um, one of, I think, your funniest sequences uh, is with Leah Delaria and Rachel Dratch. And you are actually speaking to someone because there's no men uh, present in the play. You're speaking to someone who's not on stage with you. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of keep the rhythm of this comedy that's so fast paced going when when your scene partner is not really there? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think one of the really unique, fabulous elements of this play is that it really is just about these seven women. And we refer to a lot of other people around us. We never see them and you specifically never see the men in the White House. And so this one character that I'm speaking to is is a White House reporter and you never hear his voice and you never see him. Um, but I'm having this back and forth and it is really fun because I'm basically just facing the audience talking to this invisible person. Um, but I also have these two other scene partners, Leah and Rachel. And so th having them there also reacting to this invisible person is really helpful and really fun to engage. Um, the script is written, written so well that, you know, even though his lines aren't in the script, the character, what the character would be saying, you know, we totally know what he would be saying, which is indicated in all of my responses. So it's a lot of acting and reacting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so fun to just stand on stage and react to something that the audience can't see, but they totally understand what's going on. And that's the brilliance of, of Stroh's direction. Yeah. And it's, uh, I'm, I don't want to give away anything uh, for ending, but it, it is a great play to see all of these women really stand in their power, you know, I think by the end of this. Um, what does that do for you? What are those final moments like sort of when everyone gets to come together like that? Yeah, I mean, the whole play is a, a kind of ridiculous, whimsical, wild farce, right? And we're all just hot messes running around, slamming doors, falling on the ground. But there's this fabulous element. There's this really powerful, impactful element to the end that feels like all of these women have really united. And that was really important to Selena, the writer. Um, and she actually dedicated the play to a lot of women that we all have grown to know and love, like Kamala, like Hillary, like Elizabeth. And um, one of my favorite parts of her dedication is that, you know, a lot of farces are about men. And this is about the women behind those men and how they come together in this united front. And it's just really powerful. I love it. Yeah. And um, how much kind of with this group of women, it just seems like you all have so much fun up there um, and are all like a very close ensemble. Is there a lot of room to sort of play around? Is there ad-libbing or is anyone adding anything during performances? Oh yeah, definitely. Cause there's a lot, there's always a lot going on on stage. At any given moment, there could be kind of, you know, three or four, little couplets and events happening in different parts of the stage. So we're all engaged and reacting even when we don't have lines. So I'll hear some ad libs across the stage, even when I'm in my own kind of interaction on the other side. And it's hilarious how active the whole thing is. It just feels like this kind of like bubbling mechanism, this whole play It's really, it's that's why it's it's so fun because it's so dynamic in that way. Yeah. I should also mention, in addition to this, you are a part of this new documentary, Spring Awakening, those you've known, uh, which is very exciting because I was obsessed with Spring Awakening when it first came out um, it, and saw it uh, who knows how many times at this point, but it reunites the original cast. And I'm curious, when you did reunite, like, did the old dynamics, you know, 
kind of fall into place? What was that like when you all came together for this concert? Yeah, you know what it kind of reminded me of it was like a high school reunion. You know, you've lived a whole life and you're an adult, but you go back into this setting and it kind of brings you back to that insecure teenage experience. And that's 100% what it was like. We all have lived 15 years of life after doing Spring Awakening and you know, have webbed out into the world and, and converging again and coming back together was so profound because we're adults now. I mean, we were truly teenagers, basically children when we did the show. And we kind of grew up together but it's been 15 years. And so we have so much more knowledge and life to share with one another. So it was kind of a combination of, of you know, old dynamics resurfacing and reintroducing ourselves to each other as adult people. And it was, it was really, really special. There were a lot of tears, mm. a lot of laughter, um, a lot of, you know, just making fun of each other and and having that fun rapport that we've always had. Yeah, was there anything that made you think about, you know, in your years of experience now that made you think about the material differently when you had to go back and sing it now? Absolutely, um, as a parent now, and there are three other actors in the show who are parents now. Um, one of the, one of the subject matters in the show, a really prominent theme in the show is lack of communication between generations and teenagers feeling um, unheard and invisible. And now that I have a son, rereading that script, the parent-child relationships were so much more poignant to me. And I was able to read that story, listen to the music with such a different perspective now. Um, I mean, just imagine me and Leah Michelle and Lauren Pritchard singing Mama Who Bore Me and we're all new mothers within the last year and a half. Wow. I mean, how do you not listen to that and sing it with a different perspective? It was so magical and so powerful. Mm. Well, it's very special. Um, I, I wanna switch gears for one moment here before I let you go, because the last time I talked to you was just before your Tony nomination for Tootsie. And uh, what what was that night like for you, that experience of your first ever nomination? Um, you've you know been doing this uh, on Broadway since Spring Awakening. Um, what was that experience like for you? Oh, it was so wild because, you know, I, I had kind of, I had come to terms or resigned myself to, to accept either outcome, either scenario. Um, if I didn't get nominated, I was trying to surrender to that being okay, of course, you know, because there's no guarantee and you can't expect anything. And so I didn't really even want to wake up for the broadcast. And so I actually slept through it and I woke up to my phone with you know, 60 text messages and 45 phone calls and couldn't believe it was happening. And it was a really crazy thing to wake up to. And then of course, going to the show that night when four of us had been nominated and the show had been nominated for so many awards, it was one of the most thrilling nights in the theater because the audience knew and they were with us rooting us on. So it was incredible. I mean, it was unexpected, it was surreal. I was so proud of the work that we had all done. Um, and, you know, it's something that, that they, can, they can't take that away from you. You're officially a Tony nominee and, I, and I'm really proud of myself for it. So I, I, I like to remind myself of it because it, it fills me with joy and pride. Yeah. And what I realized too about this season with your work compared to that season is you and your dad, Chuck Cooper, were both that season, he had a winter play with mm -hmm. Choir Boy, then you had a spring musical, and yeah. now he had a, a you know play earlier on with Trouble in Mind, and, and now yeah. you're here in the spring. So maybe it's a sign. I know. <laughs> You've been able to see each other's work this season. We have, yeah. I saw, I saw Trouble in Mind on opening night, and 
I mean, that whole show was fantastic, but I thought his work in that was was transcendent, to be honest. And I would say that even if he wasn't my dad, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really was. Um, and I think your work here in, in POTUS is is absolutely hysterical uh, and wishing you best of luck with this with this show. It's a much needed comedy for right now. You might probably hear the craziness in the background right now. My dog's barking and my baby crying. They're not <laughs> watching after everything. So they're not just running amok by themselves, I swear. Well, I'll let you take care of that. If anyone's out uh, watching at home, subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep up to date with us throughout this Broadway season. Lily, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.